You are watching the biggest, you are watching the largest, you are watching the highest, you are watching the greatest, you are watching the tallest and the mightiest African spiritual platform. I'm always Queen Hadasha. Call me Labraska, the sun goddess. I am the spear of destiny. I am the woman of peace. I preach liberation of our continent and individual consciousness. That's what we do here. We are purely educational platform. We care about your individual soul. And today is a great day. We have one of the people I love. If you are in Ghana, you know I love Christianists. Just that I can't practice. It's just difficult for me. And so I love their knowledge. I tap into it anytime they are here. But for me to enter, that's where the problem is. But don't worry. Just you just enjoy the knowledge because knowledge is power and knowledge is everything. In case today happens to be your first time on this biggest platform, I welcome you. We are called Consciousness Family and individual of us is called The Pearls. I'm always your annoying host. Call me Mommy Grace, call me Revelations. In fact, let's welcome our beautiful, do we use beautiful for a man anyway? Let's welcome our beautiful guest for today. The name, Abi, you know that. I welcome you. Thank you so much for okay. having us today. So today is your first time. So please introduce yourself to the public. Tell us who you are, where you came from, and why you are here. Welcome, everyone. My name is Keshava Swami. I was born in London, although my parents are from India, my mother from East Africa. And when I was about 15 or 16, I went on a spiritual search to try to understand the meaning of life. And after graduating from university at the age of 21, I decided to travel to India for six months and live as a monk. And it touched my heart and uh, became my calling in life that I continued on. And so for the past uh, 20, uh, 22 years I've been living as a monk, traveling the world and trying to share wisdom and knowledge in a way that will benefit people's lives on all levels. So happy to be with, here, with you here today. I welcome you. Abuzia, we welcome our guests. So it's all about knowledge. I be, you know that's what we do here. We disperse knowledge will help you to gain your consciousness. Uh, so we've welcome our guests. I welcome you in case you just join us. We have a greater topic, but as usual, I will do my randoms with him. The topic is, what is the origin of the soul? Why is there so much suffering in the world? These are great questions. Everybody would want to know, I will, when I die, I will go to heaven. Uh, where were you? We will go to heaven. So where did the soul come from in the first place? And where will it go? Is everybody, does everybody have opportunity to go to heaven? Or it, it's just a reward for some people for doing a particular thing? That's what we are going to discuss. But I'm going to do randoms with him before um, we start. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask you questions that are not part of your topic before we get into your topic. And I'm not going to take you out of your your fraternity you will be here i have had um about four of your people on this platform N and uh, they say one thing not being materialistic they keep saying this they keep saying this so i'm going to ask you when they say materialistic what's the meaning of that thank you so much welcome what we tell people is that it's not that spiritual people don't own anything, but it's that spiritual people aren't owned by anything. So even as spiritual people, we have phones, we have cars, we have houses, we function in the world, bank accounts. So we have material things and we use material things. But the idea of not being materialistic is not to allow your mind to be consumed by those things, thinking those things will actually bring you happiness. They say we're supposed to use things and love people. But nowadays what people do is they love things and they use people. So actually we're supposed to utilize material things in the purpose of serving and loving others. Okay, so it's not about having more of it. 
by having it and not helping others is that what makes it materialistic yes we have many people who are very rich who are very uh, wealthy successful in the world and at the same time very spiritual because they've acquired all of those material things and then employed it to make a beautiful change in people's lives and a beautiful contribution to make the world a better place. So we need material things and we use them for service. But don't let it consume you. Exactly. That's a, a lot of your people have been here. I think they love me and I love them. So when they come from far and near, they visit this platform. Nobody has come here with a stick. <laughs> Why are you having a stick? You, ha you wear different colors of clothes. What does it represent? Is it your position somewhere white, somewhere yellow, some, you know, yes. blue and all that? What, 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 what does it represent? Broadly speaking, there are two types of Hare Krishnas. One are those who wear white or maybe other colors like blue or cream. And then there are monks who wear the saffron. So the monks who wear the saffron, they are renunciates, celibate monks, and they live in this way in the monastery. And those who are in white, they live in the world, they have families, they perhaps have jobs, but they continue to practice this spirituality within their lifestyle. So anyone in saffron, you should understand to be a celibate monk. And some of the monks in Saffron carry a stick. So this in Sanskrit is known as a danda. And this stick is made up of three bamboo rods. And when a monk decides to dedicate their entire life to celibacy, then they carry one of these sticks. So these sticks represent a lifelong monk. Wow. Okay, so um, if you are a celibacy monk, what and what do you do and what and what are you not supposed to do? So we have general principles of spiritual practices that we do every day. For example, we rise very early in the morning. By 4.30 a.m., everyone is up and functioning. The morning hours of the day are used for focusing the mind and bringing the spirit and the consciousness aligned. And then during the day as monks, we do different activities. We try to serve the world, we teach, we do philanthropic work, charity work, like that. So these are the positive activities that we do in our life. And then there are things that we avoid. For example, no intoxication. Uh, another thing we avoid is uh, non-vegetarian foods. Another thing we avoid is sexual activity or sexual contact with the opposite gender. Um, and it's explained that by controlling and regulating these passions, it actually awakens one to a higher freedom because they're not, no longer controlled by their mind and senses. Oh, so so they're, they're having um, intercourse with the opposite. Um, can you do with the same thing? You so said... Uh, yeah. are, remember I mentioned there are two types of monks. Mm -hmm. So those who are in saffron, they completely avoid any sexual contact. Like Roman fathers? Yes, exactly. Hey, so you do that? <laughs> your fine face, you won't bring your kind. We, uh, we, we don't have any sexual contact with anyone. Yes. You are watching the biggest. This is my problem. <laughs> but we have another type of spiritual practitioner who wear the white, who are often married. Oh, well, today we are talking family. about you. Yes, but... Today we, today we are talking, we are talking about, about you. <laughs> <laughs> today we are talking about you. Okay, so um, please tell me. Why do everybody go to India for spirituality? Why? India is a place in which spirituality is naturally integrated into daily life. You see, sometimes when we live, especially me in the Western world, then often people think of spirituality or religion as something they do on a Sunday. Sunday afternoon, four to six is when I do my spirituality. But in the spiritual lands like India, spirituality is a part of your daily life. 
When you go to sleep, you do it in a spiritual way. When you wake up and you eat in the morning, you do it in a spiritual way. When you go to work, it's all contributing to your spirituality. So India is a land of spirituality in which there's a natural lifestyle of spiritual culture. And the other reason why India is a very, very powerful place is because there you can meet saints, sages, gurus, uh, spiritual, spiritually evolved personalities who can give you a deep insight. And the third reason why India is powerful is because dotted around India is you have holy places and in Sanskrit they're called Tirthas. A Tirtha is basically a portal or a bridge or an entrance into eternity. And so by going to these holy places, although one is still in the material world, one can experience something of the spiritual realm. One can experience something of the spiritual realm. Um, let me ask my last question so we get into your topic. If I should be in India, practicing all this kind of spirituality to incline into the realms of the spirit as an African, do all the world worship one God or we have different gods that rule or regulate in every part of the world? You get my beautiful question? Beautiful question, mm -hmm. beautiful question. Well, when we wake up in the morning, the sun rises. And when the sun is rising in one country, that means the sun is setting in another country. Now, according to whichever country you're in, you'll have a particular name for the sun. In England, we call it sun. In India, they call it Surya. In Ghana, you call it? Area. But we're talking about the same sun. So therefore, we explain the same thing, that there's one God. There can't be two gods. If there were two gods, then there would be a competition going on. There's one God, but that one God is known by different names. And that one God, by their different names, people are connecting to different aspects of God's character. Like your viewers relate to you in a certain way, according to a certain name. But then your family members may relate to you in a different way, with a different name. But they're relating to the same person. And in the same way, different religions are actually approaching the same God, but just using different names, different rituals, and different culture. But essentially, they're awakening the same emotion of love for that divine. They, were, they are awakening the same emotions of the divine. So how come they, they have all those places in only India, not all over the world, if it's the same God? How come he is not spreading himself all over here? We don't have gurus. We don't have the same God. How come? Is it that they were able or they had the idea to hold it and to protect it and to groom it and some of the world left it? Or how? Is it natural that they have all these places and all these saints and all these gurus? How? If it's the same God, why has it gotten static in Egypt, India, and we, we are here? Why? <laughs> Very good question. Well, that same God actually sends messengers all around the world and therefore you find uh, the Christian religion or the Muslim religion or the uh, Jewish religion, these are all connected to the same God. And therefore that same God also appears around the world in different places. Now you may say that sounds okay, but still you're explaining that India is the center. India is where the spiritual places are. Thousands and thousands of years ago, the earth was very, very different to how it is now. Over thousands of years, the plates, moved, the earth as we see it today formed in different continents. But many, many thousands of years ago, the earth was actually one. It was one empire and one land, one spiritual tradition. And eventually, and the center of that spiritual tradition 
was what we know today as India. But at that time it was one land. And gradually what happened over time is that different countries, different continents, different cultures formed. Um, and therefore we have different traditions now as we see in the world. But essentially there's a oneness of spirituality uh, even though we say that the center of it is India, uh, that, that does not make it sectarian because essentially we understand that all parts of the world are connected to India. And last question, when you, you keep saying spirituality, define spirituality. Spirituality means that which is beyond the material. The material means five elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether. And most of the world is only dealing with material elements, material phenomena, material ideas, ambitions. But when we talk about spiritual, we talk about trying to explore what is beyond these uh, material elements and this world which is made of these five elements and understanding what more there may be that's moving and animating this world with consciousness. So what does it benefit the world if they should move with consciousness? Well, first we have to understand who we are. We are consciousness. So how does it benefit the world to know consciousness? Because if you don't know who you are, how will you know what will make you happy? If you have a phone, and you go into the shop and you tell the shopkeeper, I need a new battery. The very first question he's going to ask you is, what model phone do you have? Because he can give you a battery, but if he doesn't know the model, the battery may not work. So in this world, people don't know who they are. They don't know that they're a spiritual being. They don't know that they're pure consciousness. They don't know that there's something beyond the material and therefore 99.9% .9 of the people are chasing material pleasure not realizing that if you're a spiritual being no matter how many material pleasures you get it won't satiate the heart mm. so our basic point is if you know who you are then you will understand what will make you happy exactly you are watching the biggest and the largest. This question has got nothing to do with you. In <laughs> fact, it's somebody's question. And I think I should ask you. I'm going to ask three great people to get a greater answer for the fellow. But I think I should ask you. Okay, so this is it. The person said that um, she lost her husband. And um, sh now she wants to marry another man and they are telling her that spiritually the one she is supposed to marry if she marry that one and has the first intercourse without the one she wants to marry the man will die so she actually has to had intercourse with another man before going to marry um, the one the second man he wants to marry spiritually in your fraternity, how do you address this issue? Yes. Uh, this is not specifically described within our tradition that you have to do such a ritual in order to avoid, uh, avoid these unfavorable outcomes. Our main consideration when coming together with someone, when deciding who to marry, when deciding what kind of relationship to enter, our main consideration is how can we help and serve each other in order to ultimately serve the divine in a better way. And therefore, the purpose of having a relationship with someone in this world, the purpose of getting married to someone in this world is a spiritual purpose. And therefore, uh, when we're focused on that spiritual purpose, then we don't get sidetracked by all of these other things which are lesser considerations 
in a relationship. Thank you. You are watching the biggest and the largest. Now we are going to get straight into um, his topic. That was random. Thank you so much for answering all my questions for me. The topic is what is the origin of, of the soul? I think we should discuss this and add the suffering to it. What is the origin of the soul? In fact, what is a soul? So you're a soul. I'm a soul. The seven billion people in this world are all souls. The amazing thing is, even animals have a soul. And perhaps even more amazing than that, is all the plants also have souls. Wherever you find consciousness, wherever you find life, you must understand there must be a soul. Because without a soul, there cannot be life or consciousness. Okay, so what's the difference between soul, spirit, heart, and energy? What is the difference between these four? Amazing, yes. The soul is who we are, our identity. The spirit is perhaps another name for the soul. Different people use spirit in different ways. Some people talk about spirit as the subtle energy of the soul, the mind, the intelligence, all of these kind of things. The heart is where the soul resides. It's like the seat. And energy is what is produced when the soul is situated in the heart the soul basically pervades the entire body with energy. Therefore, even modern science says the heart is the center of all energy in the body. Okay, so these things that you just described, what has these things got to do with the pineal gland? Which of these things is most important to the creator or God? As we realize we're a soul, and then we connect to the Supreme Soul, then all these other facets of our consciousness are awakened. People talk about the third eye, or people talk about the chakras, or as you mentioned, about the pineal gland, all of these things. The basic point is, we are spiritual beings and we have a spiritual relationship with the divine. When you put a plug into the socket, then that plug and that appliance can access energy which is thousands of miles away in the powerhouse. So similarly, when as a soul you connect to the Divine Supreme, then all the aspects of your consciousness are fully awakened. Are fully awakened. Okay, so then, now that you have um, made us to understand what is called soul, now we can talk about what is the origin of the soul because now we know what a soul is. Yes, yes. What is the origin of a soul? Before I come to that question, I'll say one other thing. Okay. The soul has three qualities. Maybe in your younger years you read fairy tales. Mm. And how does every good fairy tale end? Sometimes bad. Yeah, but what's the usually the last line? And they lived happily after. ever after. after. Right. So they lived happily ever after. So this line points to the three qualities of the soul. Ever after means the soul is eternal. Lived means the soul is always conscious. And happily means the soul is always situated in happiness. In Sanskrit, these three qualities are called Sat, eternal, Chit, conscious, and Ananda, happy. So the soul is eternal, is always conscious, and it lives in a state of bliss. So what's the origin of the soul? There you have your answer. The soul is eternal, it's always existing, but the soul comes from God. Now that sounds a little... On one hand we're saying the soul comes from God, 
But then on another hand, we're saying the soul is eternal. Mm -hmm. But this is the way to understand it. The sun rays come from the sun. Agreed? Can you ever have a sun without sun rays? No. No. So in one sense, the sun rays come from the sun. But in another sense, the sun and the sun rays are inseparable. In the same way, we are eternal, God is eternal. But we come from God. And therefore, the origin of the soul is God. But another thing to understand is that the soul is always is eternal, is always existing, and it will always continue to exist. It will always continue to exist. So it comes from the Creator or God, and it is always in existence. So how do souls get into this mechanism? Wow, this body. That's a very good question. So it's explained there are two worlds. We are currently living in the material world, but there is a spiritual world. And this world is a reflection of the spiritual world. Everything that we see going on here happens in the pure form in the spirit world. How did we end up here? Hmm. We have a relationship with God. We were all in the spiritual world with God. But you see, in order for there to be love between God and the souls, there has to be free will. Can you force someone to love you? No. You have to give them the choice. So it's said that there are a certain number of souls in the spiritual world who begin to become curious about what life would be like to be separate from God. And when they develop that curiosity out of their free will to want to know what life would be like separate from God, then they come to this material world that we're living in. So all of us are here in this material world because we were curious to experience what would it be like mm. to be separate from God. Mm -hmm. And here we are. You are watching the biggest and the largest I, um, the platform of all knowledge. We are the mother of all spiritual platforms. You don't have to forget that. We appreciate the fact that they acknowledge this platform from afar all over the world. And when they come into Africa or come to Ghana, they want to appreciate the platform by visiting us and we appreciate them. Uh -huh. So now, the soul comes from the Lord or God. So when we come here to ex experience, whilst the soul is here on earth, in this mechanism, why is it here on this earth? And while the soul is here, what does it have to do with the job here? And how does God connect with us while we are here? Do, do you get yes, it? Yes, I understand your mm -hmm. question. This world is like a university. We come here to this world to learn lessons, to learn lessons about ourselves, to learn lessons about life, to learn lessons about happiness, and ultimately to learn lessons about our relationship with God. So therefore, in this world, we go through so many different experiences, and all of those experiences are meant to evolve our consciousness to the point where we understand I'm not meant to be in this world. I'm meant to be in the spiritual world with God. And when one realizes they're a soul, that they have a relationship with God, then what happens is at the end of their life, if they remember God, then they gain release from this world and they go back to God. But if they don't remember God, and if they still have material desires and aspirations, then they come back into this world. So this world is basically a place where we're experiencing different and things. And who is regulating that? Who would judge the soul 
that you did so, you don't remember God, go back. Who is in charge of that? God is overseeing everything. He creates the whole system. But then what God does is he creates different individuals who oversee aspects of the universe and manage things. And therefore there are different individuals who regulate what happens to the soul on its journey to the next life. Uh, but it's all going on under the plan of God. Uh, so we want to know those who are regulating. Can we manipulate them? <laughs> who are those? We want to know those who are regulating and see if we can ma reg uh, manipulate them. So many people try to do that. They are known as demigods. Mm -hmm. Demigods almost means like a half god. And therefore, they are powerful. They're in charge of different aspects of the universe. Some, some people pray to demigods for wealth. Some people pray to demigods for good fortune. Some people pray to the demigods for uh, a good partner. Is there any consequences about that from, uh, for, from doing that? Or it's okay to do that? Before There's no consequences. Back. Okay. But the ultimate consequence is that what you ask those powerful entities for, even if you receive it, it won't make you happy. Also, there, there is consequences. If it won't make me happy, but then there is consequences. So yeah. we should not do that. It's a waste of time. Okay, so go back to that question. Who regulates the... So, so for example, when we leave this body, there is a god known as Yamaraj. He is the demigod of death. And Yamaraj has messengers. And so what happens at the time of death is that the messengers of the God of death come, take the soul and accompany the soul on its destination to the next, uh, on its journey to the next destination. And so like this, there is a God in charge of death. There is a God in charge of the heavens. There's a God in charge of creation. There's a God in charge of uh, the wind. Everything is regulated by the gods. But if one's wise, then one will develop love for the one ultimate God. Because when you develop love for the one ultimate God, everyone else is included within that. Within that. Is there any regulations for a soul on this um, um, planet or this plane? Is there any regulations? Is there anything that help one? to remember his or her purpose here? Is there any God that is also responsible? Are there any regulations that if you don't have a master, that those energies will prick you or uh, give you a sign or help you to know your purpose on earth? Is there any regulations like that? Yeah. When God creates this material world, for us to ultimately realize we're meant to be in the spiritual world, then God also provides knowledge. You said this platform is about knowledge. You said knowledge is power. So the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, the Bhagavad Gita, these are all books of knowledge coming from God. And when one learns the knowledge in these books, then one can awaken their higher consciousness. So firstly, there are divine books. But in order to understand the divine books, you need divine teachers. And therefore the Quran is learned from an Imam, or the Bible is learned from a pastor, or the Bhagavad Gita is learned from a guru. Uh, like that, we have teachers. Because if we want to learn anything in life, you need to learn from someone who's understood that knowledge, but who's also living that knowledge. Okay, but so what happens to um, those? You see the Bible, let me use my, this my place. I know you will know a place in your area. There are places where you go, they don't actually know anything yes. about any of these books. What happened to those souls? It's not their fault that this knowledge has not reached them. What happened to those souls? That is one. And two, uh, what about those 
who would not have the privilege, excuse me, for some uh, maybe dis disabled people, he is maybe mm. blind or deaf and dumb. He cannot listen or he cannot um, go through to any master to help or what. What happened to those souls? Wow, very good questions. In your first question, what happens to those who don't get access to the knowledge? They live in some remote place, there's no church, no temple. What happens to them? The first thing is that, well, practically the way the world is now, knowledge can go to all places. If you think even this is your social media platform, it reaches all places. So what God does is when a soul has a desire, then God will always make some arrangement for that knowledge to be delivered to that soul. And probably there are many souls out there who are receiving this knowledge and this connection through your social media platform. That's an arrangement of God. So the first thing is that God will always make an arrangement for all individuals to have some exposure to spiritual knowledge that will spark their journey back to the spirit world. That's great. Okay, so let me ask this too, so we continue to why we suffer. All souls come from God, is that correct? Yes. All souls? All souls. Okay, so how come some people are born with deformity? Does God create deformity? Does he have some deformity or defamation souls he disbears to people here? Yes. We have to understand first that this life is one chapter of a longer story. We've lived lives before, we lived this life, and we'll continue to live after. What you're seeing is one chapter of someone's life. If you go into a movie halfway through and someone's being beaten up, it's very hard for you just from that one scene to understand what were the events leading to this. And it's very hard for you from that one scene to understand where is this going after. So life is complex. Why people are placed in suffering conditions, we don't know the specifics and neither it is for us to judge them. But what we can say is that everything that happens, happens for a reason. And therefore, even in the struggles, the difficulties, the painful situations, the obstacles that people have to face in their life, there is some spiritual benefit that they will get from that which will help them on their onward journey. What we tell people is that not everything in life that happens is good, but something good can come from everything that happens in life. And therefore, even in the difficult situations, for example, a disability or deformity, we have to understand that the soul is undergoing some evolution in that life which will help the soul on its journey to free itself from that suffering. So what, what possible, what, what kind of revolution will be going through someone who is born, excuse my language, autistics, someone who is gone and eating from trash, what kind of evolution will possibly go through that person's soul? He, did, he was born uh, blind, he was born uh, autistic, he cannot talk, he cannot grow well, he can't even walk, he was born with it. So let's talk about people who were born with this serious uh, um, de deformation or what do we call disabilities. Yes. What, what, what kind of revolu evolution do you think these people will be going through? You were born with this autistics. You are 20 years. You come back. You can't do anything on your own. You, a soul that came from God is here with, with autistics. He can't walk. He can't cook. Like he can't actually participate 
in anything we do here, a soul that came from God, what kind of evolution will be going through such a soul? What did he do? Mm. Well, there's one big learning that would come from that. That this world is a place of suffering. That in this world, this body can never allow me to fulfill my deepest desires. The soul that goes through such suffering can develop a very uh, vivid awareness that I need to get out of this situation. And therefore, it's not for us to judge why would someone be put in such a situation. We are not God, we can't answer that question. But what we can say is that the acute suffering of that situation will leave a very, very deep impression on the consciousness of that soul that will help them in future lives to actually be released. Most people in this world don't understand or doesn't register to them that this place is a full place full of suffering. Most people see the shining sun, the nice gardens, they achieve money, they go on holidays, they think this world is a happy place. They have money, they have beauty, they may have fame, influence, power. And we may look at them thinking they have a happy life. But actually their happiness is transitory. It doesn't mean anything because it ultimately won't satisfy their soul and it ultimately imprisons them in their own illusion. Whereas sometimes someone who goes through suffering, through difficulty, through pain, they get this deep realization that this world is not my true home. This body is not where I'm meant to reside. Look at this body, I can't do anything with it. And so we tend to judge saying these people have a very nice life, these people have a very, very difficult life, but basically everyone has a difficult life because none of us are meant to be here. But sometimes those people who have difficult lives, they develop a deeper awareness and consciousness of what may lie beyond this world. And we may think they're unfortunate, but actually they can develop a great fortune of spiritual realization through their struggle. Is God a loving God? Of course. Does He love us? He loves us. So does He see pain? Of course He sees what pain. What has God, to, God got to do with pain? How does He feel when one is going through pain? Does He have feelings in the first place? God is full of feelings, full of love, full of relationship. God wants us to be with Him in the spiritual world where there's no anxiety, where there's no obstacle. However, He can't force us to be there. That has to be our own uh, volition and desire to be there. So what God may do in this world is through different situations send painful experiences. That's not because God wants to put us into pain, mm -hmm. but because He wants to get us out of the greatest pain. I'll give you an example. Here in Africa, you have fans on the ceiling. And you know children, what they sometimes want to do is touch moving things. But the mother, she knows if the child touches the fan, it will break its hand. Mm -hmm. So you know what the mother does? Mm -hmm. You protect the child from touching it. But she may also do something else. She turns the fan switch off. Then the fan slows down. When the fan is fast enough to give the, pain, give the child some pain, but the fan has slowed down enough so that it doesn't give any permanent damage, then the mother may say, touch it and the child feels that pain. And you won't try to touch it again. And you won't try to touch it that again. That is what God, what, what God does. Exactly. He gives us some pain in this world, which to us seems very, very great, like the child touching the fan. But just like the mother is doing that purposely, 
to save us from a gator pain. In the same way, God is ultimately releasing us from a greater pain. Okay, so we hear this every day that there are demons, there are uh, uh, wicked, there is, there is Satan, there is this. That is actually troubling mankind or divinity to get through to divine or to get through to eternity. Yeah. How true is this and who created them? Yes. In the Eastern conception of spirituality, there's no Satan. There's no ultimate devil or ultimate power which is against us. But there may be influences, there's energies, there's what we call Maya, which is a Sanskrit word meaning illusion. So there's a certain illusory energy which is covering us, keeping us in ignorance. Uh, that even that comes from God. So you may say, why does God put an energy of illusion in this world if He wants us to come back to Him? Mm -hmm. But God can't force us. And so if we want to experience what life would be like separate from the spiritual world, then God creates an illusory energy by which we forget the spiritual world. And then we can pretend to try and be happy here. But the moment we turn to God, that illusory energy is lifted. The moment we turn to God, all of the negative demonic influences which cover our real knowledge, they don't stand a chance of remaining. And therefore, yes, there is illusion, there is negative energy, there are demoniac influences in this world which block our journey to the spiritual realm, but God and His power is much greater and therefore if you connect with God then none of those things have an opportunity to remain. Hmm. You are watching the biggest and the largest and we are discussing what is the origin of the soul and why is there so much suffering in this world? I think we've gotten enough about the souls. So why is there so much suffering in the world? See, it's like this. The first class person learns by hearing. The second class person learns by seeing. But the third class person has to learn by experiencing. And therefore, although all of the knowledge is given in the books, most people don't hear that knowledge and understand it deeply just by reading. And therefore what God does is He arranges a world in which many, many experiences are given to us as a way of teaching us what He's already told us in the books. And therefore this world is full of so many difficult situations to remind us of the higher knowledge that God has given us. Okay, so if that is so, the suffering, where is it coming from? We, we are, the, we are the architects of our own suffering because we made the decision to be separate from God. A soul that is coming from God, how does that soul create suffering? How did we know suffering for us to create it? We are coming from God as souls. I don't think we know anything. So who introduced all those things to us? Who? Well, our first mistake was that we desired to be separate from God. When we desired to be separate from God, then God had to facilitate our decision because man proposes. God disposes. God disposes. So God had to create a world. God didn't want to create this world, but we wanted it. And therefore we came to this world. Now in order for us to live in this world, we have to be put into some kind of ignorance. When you go into a cinema, before the movie can start, what's the first thing that happens? You have to turn all the lights off. So this world is like a cinema in which we're trying to experience something. So the first thing is we have to be put into illusion. And when we're put in that illusion, then we suffer. 
Because suffering means you don't know who you are, you don't know what will make you happy. And so as soon as you're disconnected from your identity, necessarily you will suffer. Hmm, my last question before we come, we come to the end of the show is this. So is heaven a reward? Is heaven a reward for mankind? If yes, how? Earlier in this podcast, I mentioned to you there is the material world and then there's the spiritual world. What the Eastern books of wisdom like Bhagavad Gita explains is that in this material world, there are lower planets, middle planets and higher planets. The higher planets are heavenly planets and they are places that you can go to for material reward. But even if you go to the heavens, that's still within the material world. And so you can go to the heavens and you can experience great happiness in the heavens. You can enjoy thousands of years in great uh, material uh, pleasures. But ultimately it still won't make you happy because you are a spiritual being. And therefore, in many religions, what is talked about is going to the heavens. But actually in the most evolved religions, they tell us not just to go to the material heavens, but to ultimately go to the spiritual world. So it means it's, it's about yourself and where you want to go, but it's not a reward for your doings. Is it, is it a reward for your deeds, like maybe um, um, sowing seed, Paying tithes. If you did some charity. Yeah, or is that what will reward you heaven? Your next destination is determined by two things. Your works and your desire. So if you have the desire to enjoy in the heavens and you've done good works in your life, then you'll go to the heavens. But if you've done good works, in your, if you've got the desire to go to the heavens but you haven't done the good works, you can't go to heaven. You can't go to heaven. So where would, would these souls go? God will watch a soul he has created. God will give the soul a suitable situation on this realm. So it comes back again. Comes back so again. if a soul decides to come back 10,000 times and refuse to repent, what happened to that soul? The soul gets another chance, keeps coming. Because <laughs> God, he never eternally damns you. He's always watching you to revolve, to come back. Just home. like if someone is sentenced in a prison, they've got 20 years in jail. But then what they do is they interview the person after 10 years. And they see if this person has changed, then they release them. Because God doesn't want to subject us to suffering. God wants us to experience bliss. But sometimes the suffering He gives is meant to awaken us to experience that bliss. But that suffering is never eternal. So 10,000, what to say 10,000? 10, 10 million, we, 10 billion. We can run back here life after life. God will keep giving us another the chance. The opportunities exactly. to make it right. Right. Yo, you are watching the biggest and the largest. I think our time is due, they are telling me. But I want you to advise the world. Most important things, things that we should focus on, things that will get us through to where we belong, that we will not bounce back to this place. Three things that we should put in all our effort to make sure it is done. So we get through to God. And three things we should run away from because if it doesn't, it will not only stop you from going to God, but it can also um, bring you down, like it will reduce you to nothing. You get me? Yes. Uh -huh. So tell us, that's advice. Give to the public. If there's anything you want to add, add uh, after the advice. And if there are any numbers you want to give for people, people would want to visit there for more knowledge. That one too, if you have give it please so thank you everyone for being on our podcast today three things you should do to develop your spirituality first thing is spend time with spiritual people 
who you keep your company with, your friends, those you let into your life, they will drive the trajectory of your life. So one, make spiritual friends. Number two, read spiritual books. They say if you want a new idea, go to an old book. Because all the decisions, all the dilemmas, all the questions and confusions that we come up with in our minds were already talked about in the ancient books of wisdom. Number two, read spiritual books. And number three, do some daily meditation or prayer, ideally in the early morning. As monks, as spiritual practitioners, we rise with the sun. When you rise with the sun, then what happens is it doubles your productivity, it triples your creativity, it quadruples your energy hmm. and it makes your spirituality exponentially greater. So number three, meditate and prayer in the early morning. And then three things that you should try to avoid. The first thing is avoid over accumulating material things because you start by owning many things but then what happens is all of those things begin to own and dictate your own life. Hmm. So what we tell people is simple living, high thinking. Second thing that you should try to avoid is criticism of other and violence towards other living beings. Hmm. The way we deal with other entities, other human beings, not just other human beings, but animals, and not just animals, but the way we deal with our environment, all of this has a big impact on our connection with the divine. So avoid any kind of violence, cruelty, or criticism, or harshness towards any other living being. And the third thing, that we must try to uh, avoid in this, uh, in this life is association of people who don't have these spiritual aspirations. When we engage closely with people who uh, are very much absorbed in the material, then what happens is we become again overcome by that influence of association. So uh, try to avoid people who will bring you down in your consciousness. So you're welcome to join us in Hare Krishna, Ghana, Accra, ISKCON, I-S-K-C-O-N. We have a temple here. Uh, we have many, many events and programs. If you Google on the internet, ISKCON, I-S-K-C-O-N, Accra, or Hare Krishna Akra, you can connect with us. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for coming. We do appreciate you. We do appreciate you. I learned you were very tired. A lot has gone on, but you decided to come and grace the show. We, pla we, we appreciate you, honestly. Thank you so much for coming. And when you go and you want to teach us, Zoom is equally available, so we can equally do Zoom. I look interview to with you. Again. Yes. So people will ask you their own personal questions. Cynthia Busia, um Krishna Fono Omo uh and Crawfoni Bebrena about platform no so no a home brassia quan so omu bedru gana no omu se ye ye juma till they walk through to our office they came to pay obeisance and as omu be chia ye in the answer ye ji omu to momu we omu program no and omu be tichi and be bre awa platform no so you know i always tell you they have the ultimate knowledge especially when it comes to consciousness i always say this it's not my first time saying this a hanti knowledge in an year encourage you say you acquire them because that is what will make you as a human being thank you so much for coming we appreciate you, thank you. and thank you so much for watching the biggest the largest and the highest african spiritual platform um we will see you same time tomorrow